The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is your embassy in the heart of Israel, founded in 1980. From our headquarters in Jerusalem through our branches in over 80 nations and yours in Canada, we seek to challenge the church to take up its scriptural responsibility, to remind Israel of the promises made to her in the Bible, and to be a source of practical assistance to all the people in the land of Israel. On today's program, Experience the art of Merv Watson, Canadian founder of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. Part two of our panel, Why do Christians support Israel? Accompany Christian pilgrims to the Church of the Beatitudes. So my, my interest in art really started very simply um, when I was uh, 10 to 12 years old. I used to listen to radio programs. Um, Jack the All-American Boy, uh, The Whistler, Shadow. And I used to go to the papers and get the rolls of paper that they would l discard from the Columbian, po uh, Columbian paper, which I delivered. And then I'd bring that out and I'd just draw while I'm listening to these programs. So that started it. And then when I was in grade seven, I started to do op art, which was a way before its time. And my teacher was a famous sculptor at school. And so he published several of my pieces at that time in a book. And, uh, and so I thought, well, there must be something here. So he, he encouraged me all the time to do more and more art. <clears throat> And uh, I found I really loved it. So uh, I used to do, I'd be in the opera, I'd sing the lead in the romantic opera, but I would also do most of the scenery, painting and, and so on. And so that was a, something that also was kind of added. So I combined music and art at that point. So then I'd hoped to go to Vancouver Art School, but all they wanted was abstract stuff, and I'm not abstract. And so I said, well, I can't waste my time on this. So I went to university for three years to, to, and took medicine. But I decided after three years that I really wasn't cut out for that. And so I got a scholarship singing and I went to Toronto and I, I uh, studied voice. Then I studied a degree in music uh, where I teach all the instruments, 15 different instruments, all the brasses, woodwinds, percussions, everything like that. And at that time, I, I was completely absorbed in music. It took a lot of work to do to learn all these instruments in a short time. Three months per instrument. So you had to take it from nothing to play something. So anyway, I, I did some artwork while I was there, but not, not, not a lot. But it, when, I got, when I found out the, the my courses were a bit frustrating, to say the least, and I had art. I, 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 can get, I can get into art. And it just it transports you to another place. And so it was very important. And spiritually, I was looking, 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 and looking at that point. I was raised in a Christian home. Um, and so I basically believed, but I didn't, wasn't going to go for the whole schmazola. I, I said, there's some things I got to know myself. So I left it all for 10 years. And at that time, I was going through art and I was going through philosophy and I was reading books. And I read a, a lot of Ayn Rand when I was 13, which is quite young for that book. It was very deep philosophy. But there was artists in there and they encouraged me to be uh, more art inclined. So I thought da Vinci was the last, Leonardo da Vinci was the last word. Van Gogh was my hero, uh, or Van Gogh in, in Netherlands, and Michelangelo. And uh, so I started to copy their work. And uh, s that plus the uh, my encouragement from my teacher, um, I discovered that I had some ability. So then it just, the rest is kind of history. I just see different objects that I like to reproduce. One of my favorite subjects, of course, is, is mountains. This one is just a quick little uh, Israeli giraffe. Now this particular technique, is not too well known on the West Coast here or in Israel, where we're spending a lot of our time. 
uh, it's called a scratch board, and literally that's what you do. You, you, you receive this black piece of paper, you draw a very light line drawing, and then you, you just take it from there and, and draw the animal or the picture out of that. And um, like, well, this one is this one's strictly from memory. This one was, this is called a winter tree, and I just made that up. But it's, it's it gives the feeling of you know bare branches and storm clouds and all the rest of it. So it's all very literal. I have a theory that because all the nations were involved in a sense in the Holocaust, they knew about it, but they didn't do anything. That they're both their music lost the melody and art lost its subjects. And so you end up abstracting things. The melodies uh, that are in composers' lives uh, up in well, the 30s and 40s and 50s and beyond are usually you don't know where they're going. It's not something you can whistle when you leave the theater if you've seen a concert. And the art was with this, boom, yeah. This back, bang. All these artists were picking up abstract ideas. They were drawing out of the art. Ella Picasso, who led the way into a blind alley, as far as I'm concerned. So the gold master's technique was set, set aside, and they did everything from uh, a blob of this, a blob of that, and I just wasn't impressed. So I left all of that and you know studied music. So then I um, studied opera. I studied opera, did several operas, um, performed in the operas, and uh, then I found that I had to make some scenery in Jerusalem. So I d designed the scenery for an opera called Amal the Night Visitors, which was a very elaborate uh, set. So I had to conceive it and then paint it and draw it and then also act as one of the kings, singing and music and hauling eight and ten bags and instruments and the accordions and all this stuff for years. And it's really time that I'd be realistic about my years. And this is far more, shall I say, passively, actively involved. In North America, our faces are fairly bland compared to where we're living a lot of time in Jerusalem. You get a phenomenal cross-section of different kinds of people, different people that have gone through an awful lot and their face show it. Uh, they, they think a lot and their eyes show it. Uh, there's a, just a lot of, there's a different thing. So I, I enjoy portraits. I did a lot of portraits in university to put myself through. This is an old man making falafels that you eat in, in Israel. And then there's to, to a light. And I see as a metaphor, Israel's been sent to be the light of the world. And this guy is dealing with elemental food and he's, he's has his own light, which he's creating. So he's feeding people and he's also spending time philosophizing as he's cutting this, uh, these falafel pitas and so on down here. This is one of the synagogues that the Jordanians ruined when they were, they, they ruined 57 of them. And this is one of the ones they ruined with his left. And I thought the ruin was beautiful in itself. Uh, this is a, a desert sheikh and his camel, his trusty camel. They, um, these camels can go seven days without water. They get loaded up with water and when Rebecca in Rebecca agreed to um, fill Aliezer's animals with water. We're talking about thousand gallons. So these things are, are amazing. And I, I just like the expressions on their face. They always look so superior. This Bedouin woman is, carries all her valuables, her silver and gold with her all the time. Uh, so that this is her dowry. This is what she brings to the wedding. Uh, when they when they marry, and the uh, and this is amber. This is real amber. All the the jewelry in the Middle East generally is the real thing. It's not uh, plastic. This is the real silver. Okay, this one I'm very happy with. It's uh, this is the headwaters of the Jordan River coming out of Mount Hermon, a place called Panyas, or Pan, where they used to worship Pan, the Earth God, and that's just down below this. And these are the this is all done in um, pencil, crayon. And uh, one of the things that I want to do is get into the art world in Israel because it's very rich in terms of quality and people and the rest of it. So I, have, I hope to spend more time in Israel um, involving myself in art lessons and the rest of it. 
either giving them or taking them. And uh, I think I can add something to the art world there. Psalm 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Hello and welcome to our panel discussion on Inside Israel. Joining me today, Sam, Bonnie, and Adam. We're discussing a part two of the question, why do or why should Christians support Israel? I'm going to start with you on this one, Sam. I'd flip it around. Why shouldn't they? <laughs> I mean, anybody who's um, what we would call today a biblical Christian, I don't see how you can't support Israel and be a Christian because, I mean, it, from, from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, mm -hmm. the whole of history is told through the eyes of the Jews, God's people that he chose, not necessarily because anything they've done, but through Abraham's faith, he promised that he would make them a great nation and that through him all nations would be blessed and that the Messiah would come from them. So anybody who has any uh, knowledge whatsoever of the Bible to not uh, want to bless the Jews and Israel, to me, I don't, I don't see how you can separate the two. Mm -hmm. The two are inseparable. Yes. Bonnie? So uh, Jesus is Jewish. And when he was walking on earth here, he was in Israel, and um, his audience was Jewish, and his disciples were Jewish, and the prophets were Jewish, and our Bible is, you know, it's all Jewish. And one thing that he said in there, uh, if I, um, the scripture is, you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, and you mm. do it unto me. And it mm -hmm. was about visiting the, the sick and those uh, giving uh, food and that kind of thing. And so who were his brethren at that time? I mean, it, it was all in a Jewish context. So, and, and we've had discussions about to the Jew first. So mm -hmm. in reference to what you said, why not? I mean, I, I think it's very clear in scripture that we are to consider, honor, respect, and bless uh, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Now that's not to exclude other groups as well. I mean, it's nice, but there seems to be a special blessing yeah. that comes. I know myself, mm -hmm. since I've been working with ICEJ and my focus really, I've, I've had more opportunity to give not only monetarily, but of my time and prayer, I have been blessed way beyond what I would have normally expected uh, because I, I feel like I've been, been fulfilling what the scripture has to told bless. us to do. Mm -hmm. To bless Israel, yeah. Adam. Well, I, I think it's so important that believers in Jesus recognize the immense spiritual debt that they have to the Jewish people. Uh, you know, you guys mentioned it very well. They're the ones who brought uh, Torah, the, the, the prophets. All of them were Jewish. Christianity, in essence, is Jewish. It's a Jewish faith. Um, but, you know, looking on the flip side of things, you know, taking out the spiritual uh, aspect of it, which is very important and heavy, we need to uh, support Israel because, you know, when we study the history of the, of the modern state of Israel, we know all the facts are, are on her side. Um, you know, this is a legal nation that's been legally required, acquired under international law, uh, that has a right to exist and have secure borders. You know, Israel is an, and a nation like any other nation. And when we see the world community in many ways turning against that, you know, we need to really step up and speak out against that injust injustice. Um, I'm glad that you're bringing up the injustice because that is something that has always grated on me from a child, the injustice of it. Mm. Um, you have this tiny nation that was l legitimized in 1948 and the, and the minute the nation was born, it was attacked again in 67 and 73 and still the attack continues. And even when the United Nations gets together to have their discussions about um, um, problems with world peace, Israel gets the blame. Yeah. And when you look at the facts of Israel from its birth onward, and you look at Christianity from its birth onward, and the Old Testament of which Christianity is founded on, it makes perfect sense to have a gratitude. However, there's another force at play because I know in the Palestinian territories, they actually teach. They're, they actually advertised on one of their TV shows that the, the Holy Trinity was, quote, uh, Abbas, Arafat, and Jesus, who they call the Palestinian because he's born in Bethlehem and that area happens to be controlled 
by the Palestinian Authority, which is crazy, because Scripture talks about Jesus being from the house of David. But you do have this, this division we see happening, and it keeps on cropping up. The Palestinians versus the Israelis, so that if you support Israel, then you're being a bigot, then you're supporting an apartheid state, and all of these accusations, not one of them could be legitimately supported. So what would your suggestion to be to Christians today um, to perhaps show more support toward the nation of Israel? Because the anti-Semitism we see out there, frankly, is disgraceful. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, all Christians have a voice. We all have a voice. We live, thank God, in democratic countries where we're able to speak out against injustices. People love to go on social media of every platform and speak something, but that we forget the power of that. Good point. You know, if, if, if there's more believers that are speaking out um, against the injustices uh, happening in Israel, you know, it is, it is a nation that is surrounded by neighbors who are committed to her destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when people can realize, when they see things on the news, they see things in the media, um, and be able to speak out against false news, accusations, mm -hmm. and propaganda, it's quite important. Mm -hmm. I think there's an important thing to note, too, with Christianity, and I'd love one of you to comment on this, that we have been taught through Yeshua to feed the poor. Mm -hmm. There's this whole setup that puts the Palestinians as the ones that are poor and the ones who are being victimized by the Israelis. So we see the poor, we see the rich, and that tends to be an attitude of liberation theology that we see permeating the church without investigation. Could one of you comment on that? Where were they when the Jews were poor, when Israel was first founded? And, I mean, you know, it, it, to me it's a theology of convenience, and I think we have to remember yes. that at its core, mm -hmm. this is a spiritual conflict, because if you look at the facts, you look at the logic, it, it, it's, you, you can't argue against it. So therefore, if people are still feeling that way, it's because the facts don't matter. So I think sometimes we think, and I would argue that the Israelis think as well, we don't have to go out and do PR or anything because the truth will just come out. But it'll only come out for those who are prepared to accept it and to be balanced. And most people have already made up their minds. And I would argue that that's because you've got Satan blinding them. Right. So, uh, I mean, the Jews, as they say, are the apple of God's eye. So what, how do you get back at God if you're the devil? Well, you attack the people that are close to him. So you attack the people through whom the Messiah uh, has come, as we believe as Christians, or will come, as a lot of Jews believe. So until we recognize that this is not a battle of, of flesh and blood, uh, it's spiritually right. You're right. Th that that yes. to me There's is that reason. component, but scripture also talks about my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and the truth setting your mm. feet. And I, I, I remain um, flabbergasted at how much when you start talking to groups about the factual information, many of them haven't heard this stuff. Mm -hmm. and you, yep. you're So right. we just have to keep on with courage. Well, we're out of time. That was pretty quick. <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much for joining me. Up next, Christian Pilgrims at the Church of the Beatitudes. Multitudes, welcome. <laughs> he went up to the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. He opened his mouth and started teaching them, saying, Blessed.
so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Praise you, Lord. Thank you for the life we have. Ceremony on the Mount is not just a site. It's, it's really the basic philosophy foundation of Christianity. Who's going to inherit the kingdom, the kingdom. of heaven? Yeah. Yeah. So, this was always a Christian site. And I don't have to repeat myself, telling you there was a church here that was destroyed by the Muslims, but the church wasn't here. There were slopes on the mountain, of the mountain. It was destroyed. And this is a modern one from the 1930s. By the way, by the year uh, 2000, uh, John Paul II, the Pope, he was here, he was preaching for over 200,000 Christians gathering here and talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're not. Yeah, the nuns here, the nuns here always tell us to, to be quiet and uh, we're not allowed to guide inside the church so I'll just tell you in general what we're going to see. Um, the guy that designed the church is somebody we're going to see a lot of his works. His name was Antonio Berluzzi. He was an Italian who was active here uh, from the 1920s to the 90s, 1950s. And he built a lot of the most important churches in the Holy Land. So when he came to design the church over here, of course he knew very well the, the Sermon on the Mount, saying that the poor will inherit the kingdom of heaven. So he couldn't build here a big, impressive cathedral. He had to build something that will reflect the, the idea of the sermon. So you look at the church over here. First of all, it's not big. And it's made from uh, the local stone. Okay, the black stone, uh, the, the, the dome is greenish, bluish like the sky in the Sea of Galilee. And when you see, when you will come inside, you will see the church is in modest as well inside. From both sides of the door, you will see the gowns of the popes who visited here. One from 1964 and one, one from the year 2000. Inside, the sermon will be uh, on the walls around you. The dome from inside is, is, is golden, like the, the, the moon and the sky. And beside that, like all Catholic churches, 14 stations of the cross, but the small and, and beautiful, but not going to impress you. Um, the place here is really calm and, and a very spiritual with a beautiful garden. This is, by the way, dormitory for Catholics who are coming over here. Because I told you about Franciscan and the way they address you, you can see the sister here is, is a Franciscan. And almost every, every Catholic group will come here, and almost every pope that comes to Israel will come to this place. We conclude our program today with some sights and sounds within Israel.
In consideration of Canada's 150th birthday, please consider 150 ways to bless Israel through your Christian embassy, the ICEJ Canada. Consider becoming a $150 monthly donor, plant 150 trees, 150 prayers for Israel. The opportunities are endless. Please contact us. Thank you for joining us today and be sure to visit our website at www.icejcanada.tv or call us at 1-866-324-9133. Through your contribution to ICEJ Canada, you can participate by giving to Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, Women at Risk, Red Carpet Project, Operation Life Shield, Bombproof Shelters, Shoulder to Shoulder, Alias Support, Bet Singer Children's Home, Israel in Crisis, ICEJ Communication Media Fund, Christian Friends of Yad Vashem, Megan David Adam Emergency Services, Canada Israel Young Adult Scholarship, Equip and Teach, Bet Rachel Strauss Inclusive Community, Gift Estate and Securities Funds.